Well, Plato 2. Here we are again. Here we are. Here we are again. The three of us. Drinking we, beer. We, back, back at it. We, we introduced ourselves last time, but for <clears throat> uh, all intents and purposes, Cousin T here once again. The Groovy Bear is logged in. He is here. Bike and Peaches, happy and ready. Yeah. And good to see both of you. All of the onboard things. Mm -hmm. Nice. Oh, we are nice. on board. The crew is. We're assembled. on the ship. We are. Yep. We're ready to take that voyage. All of us. Stoyaki. I don't yes. know how many more ways we want to all say that we're all here, but <laughs> present. We, we are, are present. here and present. Present. Final gravity. Present. <clears throat> Man, still figuring out how this thing uh, rolls down the hill. It's I mean, the second time we've done this. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I mean, it's it's a it's kind of like a ball, dude. I mean, it's more of like a Sputnik type of ball where it might take a long bounce. You know, because it hits a funny direction, but for the most part, it just is like a snowball, just builds and goes, man. Just builds and goes down the hill. Just kind of well, rolls. you'll get you'll get more rolls. comfortable with with this. Oh yeah, you know, we'll find our way through it, yeah. one way or another, awkwardly or not. Um, well, I think Plato Two is supposed to be the um, the dry, boring, sciencey discussion about beer. That's the memo that I was given through your both y'all's emails, correct? So that means you're hosting it, right, CJ? <laughs> Yikes! Burn City. Man, you just set yourself up for that one, and Got Sammy Sosa just knocked it out of the park. Put it on a tee. Mm. Um, we're here to talk more about the science of beer on Plato too. We're here to talk more about uh, um, what is beer at this point in time for this block. And um, to my knowledge, my humble knowledge, um, beer is a fermented beverage that has been around for about 7,000 years now. Oldest recordings were in Samaria. Um, there's records of beer being used as currency in Egypt. Um, there's beer has been with us forever, and it is a uh, every culture has its own process to ferment uh, something into alcohol, whether for religious purposes or for sheer enjoyment of it. Haven't there been recent findings of like ancient Egyptian beer recipes? Yes, there have. There's been ancient findings of um, tablets in Egypt that describe beer as a remedy for a hundred different ailments. Um, again, it was a currency. Um, the historical significance of beer to who we are is crazy, in my opinion. It's the same thing. It's up. It's right up there with domestication and agriculture. Um, it's such a huge step in our evolutionary process. What, is, what did you tell me the other day about Plymouth Rock? Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> So, to everything that I've read, Ply Plymouth Rock was not is not a great landing site, right? They didn't land on Plymouth Rock thinking, like, this is the spot. They were out of beer, and beer is potable water. Um, back before beer was the craft beer movement, back before beer was um, just simply drink to enjoy yourself or drink for flavor, um, beer is potable water. It's a fermented beverage. It goes through a biological process that, um, when performed correctly, essentially sterilizes it. And stabilizes it um, and protects it from sp any kind of spoilage or, or bacterial infection that could harm you. So when <laughs> ships run out of beer, they're, they're fucked at that point in time. And they, they essentially landed on Plymouth Rock to build a, 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 a brewery for fermentation. I mean, take that one, Mariners. <laughs> I... I'd be curious to know. I don't know if you know, just like as far as the history of beer goes, did nomadic people like the Native Americans, did they ever have fermented beverages? Um, to my knowledge and my belief, every every culture on this planet has found a way to ferment in some way. Some, um, some, something. Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, and ferment some form, form of beverage. Um, yeah, I, I would fail miserably if I tried to name them all right now, but obviously, <laughs> you know, sake, cassava, um, uh, mead, beer, beer, wine. Beer, beer or something. Yeah, mead, beer, wine. Um, there, these things are uh, cider. Um, they, yeah. If you had access to sugar, and you had access to water, at some point in time in your evolutionary process, you came up with a, a fermentation process for alcohol. And it is. Uh, it's pickling is technically. Uh, you a can make, yeah, true sour pickles and things like that. Absolutely. Um, Fermentation is fascinating. It's been around uh, forever, and um, it, there are health benefits to it. There are um, it brings incredible joy, you know, when enjoyed correctly, of course. Um, 
yeah, there, it's to me, it's a it's a beverage that uh, unites and brings people together. It's a, it's something that we all share. Um, you don't have to like beer. You can like wine. Again, you can like cider. It all really s- goes through a very similar process. Um, beer has this wonderful element to it, though, that it is kind of got the most um, options for things going on in it. Um, it is a fermented beverage of barley. Uh, now barley, hops, water, and yeast. Um, but within that range, we have beers that are fermented in conjunction with fruit. We have beers now that are fermented with wine must. We have beers that are fermented with wild bacteria. We have this very broad range of flavors and this very, um, you know, unexplored uh, or still being explored. Yeah, I was product. watching a TV <laughs> show and I watched, like, dude said that he, like, he fermented or he used... He made beer and basically like threw a piece of wood into it and let the natural yeast on the piece of wood just ferment the beer. Yep. I was um, like, that's wow. pretty dope. That's in, in in the same way <laughs> in the same way that winemakers have terroir with their with the earth that they're working with um, or their their climate and environment. Um, brewers have a terroir in just the, their own process. Um, uh, there's not really too many brewers that 100 percent brew the same way. Um, we're all doing the same general things, but there are, yes, there are people who are, um, swabbing, you know, apple skins in their backyard on a tree to find wild bacteria to ferment their beer. And there's people who are going by, um, a very regimented process like, um, the German, uh, Reinsgebot, which was a purity law enacted in, uh, 1516 that said exactly what could go into this process. So water, hops, (laughs) malt. Yeast. Correct. At the okay. time. Well, they actually didn't identify yeast at the time because they didn't understand that that was not a thing. They had not discovered yeast yet. Yeah. They just knew it worked. Um, cultured bacteria wouldn't come around for a long time. But, yeah, eventually eventually it was modified to that. Um, you have this broad spectrum of how to do one simple process that really doesn't exist, I think, in the same way in, in um, a lot of other products, similar products. It's There's just so much going on with it. Um, but the episode, we tangent, the episode's supposed to be about explaining it. Um, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a simple fermentation of malt sugar and you balance that with hops. And after fermentation is complete, you're left with a really insane beverage that tastes delicious. You're here. Yeah. Speaking of which, before we go on any further into tonight's discussion, (laughs) Uh, Josh, what are you drinking there? I am sipping on, um, Pyramid Brewing, which I'm actually not sure where they're out of. Seattle. They're out of Seattle, um, Mm -hmm. and Portland. Um, but I'm drinking their, uh, Coat of Ales Belgian Style Tripel from their Brewer's Reserve. Um, yeah, super tasty. I, it's a very kind of fruity triple. Um, I was saying right before we started, I get a lot of, uh, kind of spicy banana flavors to it. There's definitely like a little spice. Um, and then uh, almost like, yeah, and then definitely like that heavy uh, Belgian banana e flavor that's often associated with them. And then just kind of a Sounds lot like of like yeast. And uh, just really easy drinking for an 8.5% ABV. Definitely, definitely enjoying it thoroughly right now. Nice. Um, I love a good Belgian triple, so I'm glad you're enjoying that. Oh, they're one of my favorites. Um, yeah, whether fermented warm or uh, potentially with a, a hefeweizen yeast is where I think that that banana would probably come from. No. Um, so hefeweizen yeasts, no, are, are um, I mean they they are those are those are um, they're they're very similar in their flavor production, but uh, those are German usually in nature um, or Bavarian in nature. Uh, Belgians. Belgian and German yeasts do put off a lot of similar flavors, but there are some definitely some sleek differences in them. Um, I find that Belgian yeast generally, um, they'll foray into that banana flavor, which in a triple, and that spicy clove flavor, and in a triple that's backed up by a lot of um, Pilsner malt residual body and mm-hmm. sweetness, um, and alcohol, which really complements it. But um, Germans hit the, 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 the German yeast hit, hit those phenols a lot harder. Belgian yeast have a spectrum of, of a lot of softer, fruitier notes to um, apples and pears, things like that. Whereas German starts to really um, get uh, into, which when you like that kind of beer, those wonderful cotton candy notes and things like that. Mm. So mm. Um, they, they're similar. I'm not saying you couldn't, 
I'm not saying you couldn't maybe make a you couldn't make a triple and throw a half of ice and yeast at it, but I think that a diehard purist and a good taster would also call you on it and say you've kind of gone you've skewed too far to one side. Uh-huh. If that makes sense, they definitely again flavor profiles for sure similar, but then there's those um, very sleek and subtle differences between the two and how they ferment. And um, makes sense. And when I brew, I'm one to think about a lot of things and, and think, you know, I could, you can malleate and move a lot of things around, but then there's also certain elements. It's just lines just, you all cross. Well, a thousand, two thousand, seven thousand years of brewing has taught us a few things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess, I, I guess that's so. fair. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes you can't row upstream. You just got to float the boat down. <laughs> that is a trademark quote. Nobody else can use that. I actually trademark that today. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Did, None of, did you write it down and mail it to yourself? Use, I can use it. Okay. That's my quote. Groovy bear. TM. <laughs> R. Hard R. Well, Thomas, uh, what are we drinking, man? Uh, shameless plug. Shameless plug. Well, I won't start off with a shameless plug. Uh, before the episode, I was uh, enjoying a 60-minute IPA from Dogfish Head. But, uh, Which we could swing back into at any point. We, we will. There are it's a few beer. left of those left in the fridge. Uh, but CJ uh, nobly brought over a growler of a... That's all. Del- absolutely delicious uh, IRA that he himself made at Baxlow Ooh. Brewing in Columbia Falls, Montana. Sure did. But because there, I'm shamelessly shameless plugging plug. that, yeah. I'm wearing a Bonsai Brewing hat, I'm wearing a Sacred Waters t-shirt, and I love every brewery in the Flathead Valley. I think they all do a kick-ass job. Fuck yeah, yeah. Yes, they do. Um, Including Orion's Belt Brewing, which was being ripped off. Orion's Belt too. kills it. Great and it's, get, it's, it's getting better, getting better, getting better. Yeah, speaking of bonsai, bonsai brewing, bonsai brewing, uh, rep, repping all the locals hard Actually, today. If we're, if we're gonna rep it too, real quick, I definitely thought about um, the Due North India Red Ale that Grant brews over at Bonsai Brewing when I met and, and, and I was gonna make a comment that it's a fantastic. Holy game. shit! Look at this! Look at this guy. They, they can't see that. What you're that's, pointing at, they can't see. That's okay. I, I wish I could get you're up and move the camera screen. right now. And I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of breaking a fourth wall for this squirrel that, like, <laughs> hopped up. So y'all can – for those of you that are watching the YouTube video, if you're looking at us, to my left, there is the kitchen window. And right now, there is a squirrel sitting <laughs> on the banister outside the window – Peering in here like he wants a piece of me no. and CJ at the same time. Like, motherfucker, I Ooh. wish a dude, dude would. Just snap a quick photo of him and I'll edit it into the video. Hold on. <laughs> let me let me see if I can get a, a, a picture of this. Gonna, you're going to lose him. You're going to lose him. Shut up, CJ. Get him. I, I'm, I'm working on it, dude. Shut your mouth. Don't. Oh, oh I have a girl. Get it. Uh, I told you you're gonna lose it, dude. Dude, I told yeah. you, I told you, you don't you call gonna... for the shutout before the game's <laughs> over. Bro, fire that shot. You had a clean shot like 15 seconds ago. Oh. Fire that shot, man. We missed it. Wait, oh, no. We it. Bloopers. We'll, we'll, we'll nope. find a squirrel. I got his ass. Okay, I got it. Put Great. the squirrel's ass in the video. Great. Damn. <laughs> Send that Great. on over to me. <laughs> we are in a uh, semi serious beer podcast, and we are gonna get that squirrel's ass sent right over to Josh. Get yep. it over. Yeah. Yep, it's on its way. <laughs> anyway, right. so now, now to get back to the the topic at hand here, yes, um, I was going to make a uh, a quick comparison comment because I have drank my fair share of the IRA from Bonsai, uh, not quite as much as our buddy Chops, who just drinks the living shit out of that stuff. Ian Castellucci, good man. Shout out, Ian. Uh, the the difference that I see off the bat, and it's not a good or bad thing toward one beer or the other. It's very uh, subjective. Objective? Subjective? I forget what the fucking difference is. It doesn't matter. Subjective. Uh, The Bonsai IRA has a very uh, punchy, sharp bitterness to it, which while I enjoy, I also don't mind a softer, longer lingering bitterness, which is exactly what the IRA that you made tastes like. I get a, 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 a more of a residual soft lingering bitterness than just kind of like a punch to the tongue, which again, I said, you know, I don't mind, totally. but 
uh, for comparison and styles, that was, you know, the, the maltiness between both is relatively <laughs> similar. You know, it's a fun style. There's yeah. a lot of flavor. There's a lot of flavor in reds. There's a lot Dude, of flavor in IPAs. IRAs are fun by style. far one of my favorites. There's a couple, um, the rock crawler red from uh, bridge 99 over here in Bend. They make a fantastic red, uh, IRA. And then, yeah, actually the Dew North was like one of the ones I drank pretty much every time I went into bonsai, if it was on tap. Solid beer. Solid beer. Yeah. They're definitely. both, they're, they're both definitely solid beers. They obviously have their, their differences cause they're, you yeah. know, like, as you were just saying, they're made by two different brewers and yep. two different brew houses on two completely different yep. systems and processes. So. It's fascinating. It's one of my favorite parts about the process is how frustrating it can be to, uh, you know, I mean, you can, you can certainly make things very precise and very efficient all the time, but you know, part of the uniqueness of brewing is, is who's brewing it to me and, and, and how they're brewing it and why they're brewing it. Um, small breweries are fun that way. So we get to have a lot of fun with that. Um, so now that we know what we're all drinking. There's got to be like a legion of doom <laughs> for, you know, like local small beer brewers. And I don't mean like the uh, the Craft Brewers Association. But there needs to be like <clears throat> a table in the back of an Italian restaurant where you all get together and like <laughs> sit down and, and, and talk bullshit. And, How do you know there you know, isn't already? Oh, Maybe man. it's just secretive. Maybe I'm just not allowed in yet. <laughs> That'd be a funny table to sit at. Right? <laughs> funny table to sit at. <laughs> uh, I mean, bar, barring myself, obviously, because I'm not a professional brewer in the Valley, but trying to sit down at a table with you, Joe, Rob, Graham, and Warren would be hilarious. That'd be very, yeah. That'd be, it's it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like palling uh, chefs together in a weird way, like, yeah, we all do the same thing. We all have a lot of respect for each other, but we're all very, like one of the reasons why we do it is we're uh, that'd be I'd I'd struggle at conversation at that table. I'd be like, uh, "Hey guys, what'd you do yesterday? Move water around like I did? Cool. <laughs> what does yours taste like?" <laughs> um, I don't think I don't think you would struggle as much as you you think you you would. I think you that'd, just, you'd that'd be a, that'd be a funny conversation. We so need a few a... beers to get that one loosened up. I would. I just would want to sit around and listen to that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> to be a fly on the wall. Um, <laughs> but to 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 get back into. Uh, well, yeah, I just had a thought. Now that we introduced our beers, jumping back into it, we can um, kind of talk a very quick uh, process. Well, on, I mean, you brew what it takes to make these beers. Drinking, so how did yeah. you brew it? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I brewed it a lot like everybody else brews beer. Um, <laughs> I, if we're going to go straight through the dry and the fun at the same time, you know, beer, it, it starts agriculturally. Um, we start with barley. Uh, we get it malted and germinated and ready to go, which um, in very quick terms. Just I don't think enough people know uh, enough about, honestly, Fair enough. the fact that like the, the, the malting and germination process of these – so key ingredients. Don't, don't hold me to any hard terminology here, people. Um, I, I'm <clears> going off. I don't have my books right in front of me, but um, and I don't professionally malt barley. But um, uh, barley, just like wheat, just like rye, are all grains. Um, after it moves from the field, it gets soaked and allowed to germinate. Um, essentially, that's the opening up of the kernel and allowing starches to be made readily available. Uh, from there it is dried, sometimes kiln, sometimes fire roasted, um, sometimes smoked and then brought to the brew house, um, which we take this grain, which is now ready to have some, uh, enzymatic activity happen with it. And we do another hot soak on it, which is called a mash. Um, that mash allows naturally occurring enzymes to turn starches into sugars. And before you go any further, you I'm going to put gonna, that up. Yeah. I'm going to bring up this, uh, going. I'm gonna bring up a quick. Image somebody, here. somebody I know in the industry is gonna hear this tomorrow and be like, "Man, you totally fucked that up. The whole <laughs> missed the iso semi isolation of proton particles, bro." Someone's gonna hear me slip on when I'm going through this, but I hope we're oh, yeah. right. I, you know what? I'm so glad you're the one that's hosting this episode. Yeah. Even you know. Well, Even if I miss a few words, this still tastes pretty okay. So yeah, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm not going to disagree we're, we're with okay. that. We're doing okay. Yeah, yeah. all right. All right. As far I'm going to bring up a uh, – goes, I was actually walked through that um, at a yeah. distillery in Scotland a couple years ago. Like they walked us through their whole malt process. And yeah, it's pretty much that. You want to kill it like 
right as the germination starts. So it doesn't start growing and using up its own sugars. But Correct. All, it's all just open and there and easy to access. And You're, you are manipulating in a beautiful way, a biological process. You're using something to its, its fullest potential through yeah. understanding what's happening, um, which is amazing. Um, and I also, since we shamelessly plugged it and since we're on the topic of barley, want to shamelessly plug, uh, my friend Ryan Fifely at farm power malt, uh, out in power Montana, who's doing a killer job of just that growing his own and malting his own local barley, Hell yeah. which is Hell insane. Yeah. Um, so anyway, in this uh, case, yeah. we get this let wonderful – you got that up? Yeah, let me bring this image up here. So um, for those that are uh, listening in, you can go and search for um, brewery process flowcharts and – Or just find uh, us on YouTube and watch the video. You could do that too, but if you happen to be not available to get to YouTube at the moment – Search for uh, brewery process flowcharts, and you can kind of follow along in the explanation. Uh, let me get this up here. So, do 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 do, and done. Okay. So there we go. There we are. So the point we're talking about right now is before, right here. That is a fantastic flow chart. Yeah. It's, it's a really good flow chart. Um, so what I've been circling is the mill <laughs> that will essentially crush malts and break the husks on the outer shells of these germinated and kilned grains that allows for water permeation to get in and extract the proper proteins and sugars and alpha-beta amylase and everything out of the grains to Correct. create your basically your base wort before yes. you begin to your, get to your boil. So I will let CJ take back over. No, nope, you're you're 100 correct. Um, we've we we understand you know what the temperature range is for that reaction, and we allow again yeah natural enzymes to start picking apart carbohydrates and making them, turning them into sugars. Um, from that point, we're going to start transferring that very viscous, essentially <clears throat> simple syrup to the boil kettle. And chasing that with hot water, uh, which is known as the sparge. Um, the sparge is intended to do a few things. It shuts down enzymatic activity depending on what temperature you sparge at. And it also collects the last of the runoff because there will still be so many thin sugars that you've accessed off that barley that need to come with it. Um, and then it serves to dilute that down to a proper... Um, sugar concentration before cooking as well. So we do all that um, in terms of recipe design. Once we've gotten all the sugars out of the mash tun, we are boiling, uh, which we do for pasteurization. We do for iso uh, isomerization of hops and for potentially caramelization of sugars as well. Um, and a reduction of liquid or a concentration of liquid. Yes, that's a, uh, that's a byproduct, but absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You concentrate a little bit, um, you know, depending on the scale that you boil at, you concentrate, if you're, if you're home brewing, which is wonderful and keep doing it, you're going to concentrate your word a lot more by boiling. Uh, those of us, you know, you know, when you're boiling eight barrels of liquid, you're still left with just about almost eight barrels of liquid. It just, <laughs> that volume is fucking so insane. Um, but you concentrate and you – here's where you really start to develop the, the base flavors of the beer. Um, from the mash, you pulled off a lot of sugar. Here you're turning those sugars um, and showing those malt flavors out and you are adding bittering units uh, by adding hops and which are going to eventually balance out and flavor the beer. And for those of us who love the Great American IPA, this is the, – the kettle's a, a big thing right here. In terms of flavor, this is this is your this is your shining star if you're making yep. an IPA. Absolutely, yeah. it's your, I mean it's your shining star no matter what you're doing. But yeah, you're, you're getting you're, if when you're going after a hoppy beer and understanding what's happening in your kettle, super important. Unless you're making a step mash, and then your then your ton is your. <laughs> yeah, I mean again, there's just so many so many processes in this thing that are oh, like, endless. It's crazy. Um, from the kettle, now that we've ensured that we have a pasteurized liquid in terms of the, the, the general brewing process, now we've got to move to cooling and getting it into fermentation. Um, that will vary if you are a sour beer brewer. That will vary if you are 
um, a cool ship style brewer. But in general, for the modern American brewery, we want to get our beer now as cold as possible, or excuse me, not as cold as possible, but um, down to fermentation temperature as quickly as possible. So uh, this flow chart that we're looking at here has got a clearing mechanism. That's whirlpool or a screen, whatever you can do to kind of sort your hop situation out, get that into a compact cone and start pressing as clear liquid as you can through a, what I recently got to break down a plate heat exchanger. Um, and that is a lot of thin stainless plates that have been designed to flow cold water, one direction and hot wort the other direction. And thus when you're sending 200 degree liquid one way, you're coming out at about 70 degrees, which is, if you're brewing an American ale, that's about right, where you want to be right, rocking out right, at. Right, right, right around where um, you want to be. Quick question about it, the uh, yes. plate, the heat exchanger. Just knowing, like, the scale of them, like, I've seen Thomas's um, plenty of times in action. How much bigger is the one that you guys have on your system? <laughs> than the one these guys? <laughs> I wish for some reason we would have thought to just have your heat exchanger right here. Um, uh, exponentially, I would say that the... <clears throat> How many plates are in yours? There's 61 plates in mine. Okay. Uh, and how many are in yours, Thomas? I believe the one that I have is a 40 plate. Okay. But the plates are a lot bigger, I'm assuming. Than the, the, yeah. the, just <laughs> the overall surface area size of the plates is, I would say, probably, it's probably six times the size. Of the the one that yeah. I have, well, it's like if just uh, for anyone watching on YouTube, Thomas's is about yay wide. It's and, a, it, uh, yay believe... deep. <laughs> so yeah. six times that size for a slightly kind of smaller industrial system. Yeah, I would I would say that the from just from my memory at Backslope that the the, the heat exchanger there is probably about a foot or so deep. It's probably about two and a half foot high, and it's probably about ten inches wide. You gotta wonder how big uh, Deschutes is heat exchange is. <laughs> it's it's yeah. The equipment in breweries is crazy. Uh, size and scale and scope are an incredible thing. I mean, when it comes to heat exchanger, it's it's kind of like an engine. I think is the best way to look at it. Like, uh, I'm working. I'm working with a four liter, and and you're working with like a, a remote control car. They both push things forward. But they are the the size and scope is so compact into something like it's when I pulled it apart. It's all relative. It's an incredible beast. It's a it's a. I wish I I wish I could pull mine apart. No, yours is solid state. Gross. Solid state. (laughs) No, I want a tube amp, bro. I want I want to be able to change parts. (laughs) I'm being solid state hard drives are the best. No matter what Mm. size it goes through, as long as you're cool and you're liquid. You're moving on to what becomes the most fascinating phase of the brewing process, though, and that is fermentation. And, that, and that's what happens. And oh, let me get – I stopped sharing the screen, but I'm going to bring that bring back, it back up. up. Bring it back, bring it back, back up. up. People got to see it. Back it bring up, it back, back up. up. Back it up, back it up. And that happens in this wonderful tank right here, this conical shaped in this device. flow chart a little conical fermenter um it can happen in a number of different things uh i like you i was a home brewer for a long time josh sounds like you've done some home brewing um i like any anybody out there's fermented something in a plastic bucket uh but yeah <laughs> on, the, on the big scale a conical fermenter another wonderful uh piece of fabrication that we get to use um the cone eventually allows for collection and usually reharvest of yeast um as I was always fond of saying, and before that I was very excited to be told, uh, as a professional brewer, your job is to propagate yeast. Um, on a small scale, you can get away with pitching batch to batch, but that conical fermenter is what kind of allows us to keep the general brewing operations going, um, at, a, at least at a cost rate that makes sense. Yeah. Yeast is yeah. expensive. And as a, as a home brewer, I did my first successful uh, – well, I wouldn't call it a, a, a. You did a repitch. I did. I did a repitch, but a re-pitch I wouldn't call up. it a transfer because <laughs> I didn't actually take it out of anything and move it anywhere else. I basically just siphoned off the liquid on top of the yeast and just pitched fresh wort right on top of it. And well, hey, congrats on the first one. It was seems to be working. Thanks, right? man. It 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 took the fuck off. Yeah, healthy yeast I, is a crazy thing. I pitched, I pitched that new wort at about. 4.30 in the afternoon, I went over to to CJ's, 
to hang out, play some cards, have some dinner. And by the time I got home, which was a little after 10 p.m., so inside of six hours, there was already a four-inch head of Krausen in both carboys. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> which we'll jump in and then get our science on that. The Krausen is the highest point usually of fermentation. That is uh, when the beer has – uh, begin churning so rapidly and vigorously with uh, what happens in fermentation to go back to the dry shit, which is that our yeast is going to convert those wonderful sugars into ethanol and flavor byproducts and CO2. And through what, what Thomas make- is referring to is the vigorous uh, foam on top of a fermenting beer as it hits the point where it is at peak um, fermentation. So, Which I wish, like I said, some some of these brew vessels had some like – view windows in them but you know as you said it's one more part to clean and you know one more spot for infection and everything else and i totally understand that but i it's, it's such a fun thing to be able to see as a home brewer when you look through the carboy and you see just this yeah. massive head of foam and you know your beer is working yeah if you have like i've got my carboys and i've got a, a homebrew size <clears throat> conical fermenter and it is cool to come home and see the bubbles in the bucket and stuff but I, I there's something about being able to actually see that working foam oh, on the top and then like putting a flashlight up to like the side of the carboy and you can actually see the the the, the churning and you know uh agitation of everything going on inside of it you know, if plexiglass could hold the weight. <laughs> that would be pretty fucking cool. Actually, it probably wouldn't because UV light is murderous. I was going to say, the, the one thing that we can get nitpicky about there is, is um, you know, beer is uh, being such a, a, a volatile um, median for flavor. <clears throat> it's sensitive to a lot of things, and it goes through a life process that is very sensitive to certain things at certain points in its process. It enjoys oxygen early on to get fermentation started and for um, the production of fatty acids uh, from the yeast cells. But um, the minute you open a packaged beer, you are oxidizing it by a brewery standard, and you're essentially Speaking those flavors are changing, beers. and you're losing it. So, oh, going for it. Going Might as well. You Might one? as well. Let's go to the 60 minute. You know, you while we're pausing minute. for a second, got to get a new beer, too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh. Cut that out. I just showed my belly on national TV. On national TV? This isn't ABC. (laughs) It feels like it. I feel like I'm a movie star. You're not on SNL. I mean, this is some sort of (laughs) SNL. If I get you an ashtray, you want to finish smoking that, Jay? Uh, Right here, right now? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's national TV. Why not? Why not? I've, I've already, yeah, yeah. Law enforcement would not have a problem with that whatsoever. Whatever. <laughs> Josh, what's what's going on there? Uh, this is uh, Oma Gang again. Uh, one that I, I don't know. I stole a lot of these bottles from my brother that he got from an old collection from our uncle. And I'm probably going to go steal more soon because this is my second to last one. But um, this one is the. Wild at heart American wild ale. Sweet. What? Yeah. <laughs> wild wild at heart wild American ale. Way to way to be redundant. So as we're talking about the brewing process, wild ale, um, I'm gonna just go ahead and take a stab in the dark and assume they mean that that's um, at least partially, if not when well, we're talking about fermentation, primarily fermented by um, what brewers consider to be wild bacteria. Uh, um To read a quote from theirs, uh, in a rarely employed technique, we use only wild Britannomycin yeast in primary fermentation, the very heart of the beer. So, good guess. Interesting. (laughs) At one time, our enemy and now our dearest friend. Shall we get back to sours, man? Um, Yeah. And going into that, again, as we talk about fermentation, there are many types of um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is brewer's yeast. Um, There's... Tons and tons of different strains. I, excuse me, could not tell you the number of strains, but they're awesome. They're out there. Um, and we kind of have those pretty well understood. Uh, we know how they work. We know what they do, and we treat them a certain way, and we get a certain product out of them, and we're really stoked to have them. But 
uh, I didn't think close this thing well. <laughs> <laughs> Still working on it? God, it's dude, all that, that it's, it, it, cork and cage. It, it's that. all that gravel moving, dude. You you become cork mm-hmm. and cage. Yeah, where's that <laughs> arm strength? With all the gravel moving, I would be able to just rip this thing right out. <laughs> no, nah, man, you're all fatigued, and that's true. One sec. <laughs> uh oh, Josh I'm still is listening. Josh has got to go get himself an adult. Pull up, Cougar. Pull up, Cougar. <clears throat> Pull up, Maverick. As oh, an man. adult. <laughs> oh, oh hey, it's my dog. Hi, Kona. <laughs> right outside happens. the window. This motherfucker is, Very o- fancy. is opening a champagne style cork with a wine key. Very Fuck, fancy. Yes, I am. Very fancy. Okay, I just want to point out when for it comes those to the that service are... industry, Josh is back in the house. He's, he's not. He's not yeah, on yeah. the tables. <laughs> I, mean, I was. I was a bar manager for a few years. <laughs> just got to do what you got to do sometimes. Sometimes yeah, you got to pull out those tricks. Oh, that's funny. All right. Well, that, give us a pour here, dude, because this is a sweet beer. Yeah. Yeah. I shouldn't say that when he pours beer ever. I should never say it on the right. Yeah. I mean, whatever, man. I feel like we can see the proper head allows for it to get Sorry. nice enough in your mustache. There's just there's just a lot of residual orange <laughs> light on both of our faces. <laughs> We're not normally this orange. We're not. We're very pale white. We live in Montana. Yeah, that's why I was I was just checking the lighting and just being like, oh, it actually looks better with the light off. Sorry, Brian. Oh, good, dude. <laughs> Your roommate's in I'm, the kitchen freaking I mean, out right now. Just, oh, what's up, Brian? What the fuck is going on? <laughs> I, just, I mean, yeah, it's a little weird sitting here in the dark with you, but it definitely looks better on the video. It does. Does it? Yeah. I yeah. can't tell. This this looks like shit. I mean, I don't really give a shit, man. I just something to think about for the future. Fair enough. Fair enough. Whatever you think. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just saying. I honestly don't know. All right. All right. What? Are, we got to we, we got to finish the process. We so we, the process. we've gotten to fermentation. We stalled at fermentation, which is something that you. Ooh. ooh, that was a good little beer pun right there. Yeah, beer pun. That you never want to have happen. Stalled fermentation. Your beer's not fermenting. It's done. Hopefully that's not happening too late. Um, anyway, uh, whether you're fermenting your beer with tame yeast or wild yeast, uh, post-fermentation beer can go a number of different ways. Um, the most common for – oh, the, this joint right yeah. here? Is that what you're – no, that's not, okay. Yeah, we can get that out. <clears throat> that's fine. We can do this on national TV. Oh, this is international shit, man. This is YouTube. This is Everywhere YouTube. but China and no North shit. Korea. <laughs> I think I'm okay. I think I'm like Dennis Rodman in North Korea. I think I'm all right. I think I'm allowed. Well, I, I don't mean, know that for sure. They love, you know, they let Seth Rogen in. So. I'm practically him. Um, yeah. <laughs> post-fermentation, uh, we look at beer packaging, which can go the stainless steel route like we do for American ales. Um, it can go barrels, um, oak vessels um, for further maturation, flavor accumulation, um, which would be a rad hip-hop lyric if I could tie that all in. Um, you just start writing some rhymes. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> and then we start um, – I mean, yeah, that's when we either decide whether that product is going to be – Sold right away or developed further. Um, bottled, tip, can, know, kegged, or aged? Bottled, can, kegged, or aged. Uh, you want to bring the uh, graphic back up, Tom? Um, sure. Give me a moment. See, this is why big podcasts like Joe Rogan and shit have engineers that aren't are on the show that just do... I don't know. All, Makes all the background. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. I, I guess I can do both. <laughs> anyway, yeah. here, here, here's the image again. Step eight, filling. Right in here. So, again, kegs, bottles, yeah. cans. Yep. There is, you know, you have you have packaging breweries. You have uh, <laughs> breweries like my own that um, prefer to sell on site and can sell on site well, and that that's a keg process. Um, there's... <laughs> You know, post-fermentation, let's jump on lagering real quick. There's uh, cold conditioning of beer for a long period of time. 
um, or cold maturation. Cold maturation. Your uh, your pilsners, your col- your colches, your um, box and things like that are going to. I go can't wait that to process. make that colch. It's going to be exciting. It's a fun process. Um, obviously, we have barrel aged imperial stouts. Uh, beers were stored in oak vessels very traditionally, historically. Most um, soured beers are in are in sour some sort beers of are perfect oak oak beer, wine, for, um, whiskey, some, yep. some sort of shit. Uh, so, post fermentation, you have a product that you kind of understand, and you either decide right then and there, or sometimes through some long, complicated decisions, what you're going to do with that beer from there. Um, and all these. All these different um, – what I, what I think is so cool about this product at the end of it is all these different processes showcase a style. You know, you can look at it as like – you could break it down into your common four-piece band and say, well, your mash is your drummer, you know, and your boil kettle is your bass player or whatever you want to do. All these different things lend to a unique process in which we can manipulate and um, – and make this product so malleable, so so flexible to whatever we want to do with it, or whatever we don't know it's going to do with itself, and it's uh, it's fascinating. Yeah. Sorry, man, I got I got lost there for a second trying to like <laughs> assimilate beer equipment to band pieces of a band. I didn't expect to wax poetic, but I also didn't expect to light up the joint, so I can't be held accountable for what I say anymore. Fair enough, man. Um, uh, so a question I had for the uh, two brewers in the room uh in the two rooms i guess um the step seven that was there on the flow chart filtration i know that doesn't happen on every beer uh it happens on some like the whole new england hazy ipa trend took off a while ago um clarify like what filtration is and like whether or not you use it on most of your beers stuff like that that's i would say brewery specific like i would think I know not every brewery does. Anheuser Busch and Miller Coors probably have some sort of filtration process because they want their beer clean and clear and you know completely um, transparent. <clears throat> rather than, I, I feel like a lot of micro brews don't have uh, a a post fermentation filtration process, and if they do. It, it's kind of yeah, you it's, know. It's a hard statement to make. I, there's a lot of people who take their their beer. I'm good at the moment. Thank you. Yeah. There's a lot of people who take their beer clarity very very seriously. Um, yeah, filtration and, and macro brews are always there. There are centrifuges. There are uh, many different ways of fining um, beer so it can be. That's technical uh, term. Really, what that is, is is shelf stable. What we're looking for there, the the common theory is that a bright beer is very shelf stable. If you can remove all the solid particulate that causes light to make things hazy, then the beer can't spoil as fast. Um, it's funny because the some of the what we consider now to be what I what I applaud for their packaging and for their ability to do things 100 percent all the time. But I don't really drink their beer. <coughs> the big macro breweries are very good at packaging and making things shelf stable. They've they've come up with a, tons of different great, great ways of finding beer, and they have the money to do it. Um, and that sh- general findings that sorry, that, that filtration process uh, basically removes any sort of uh, room for oxidation. I'm assuming um, solid like- particulate can increase oxidation. <clears throat> Again, it can it can increase um, volatile reactions in the beer um, from a number of different things, including um, well, light UV light. Uh, the 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 general consensus is bright beer is very is very shelf stable. It's very non changing. Well, hence um, why beer is typically stored in round bottles to correct. keep more light out. And correct. Well, Which, part of, part of the reason I was asking was this beer is actually quite hazy. For those people watching on YouTube, you can see, and it actually does say at the very end of their description, "Let the beer age." Yeah. Which is not a common thing in beer. That's very much a wine thing, but. I have to imagine this one wasn't filtered. Um, well, Wild Ale too. too um, I, I'm going to imagine that some yeast was carried over into that bottle when you poured it. Uh, yeah. It, there's, there, again, so many different steps in it. Um, wild beer, beer that sits in a barrel for a long enough time for all the bacteria to consume all the proteins is going to appear bright and magnificent. But um, if you had bottle conditioning or um, that is post-fermentation, re-fermentation in the bottle to ca- naturally carbonate the beer – you will still have a layer of yeast at the bottom of that bottle, 
And so depending on how aggressively you poured it, you may have carried some of that over with you is what I think might have happened. Or mm-hmm. white, you know, while they're saying it's aging, that's probably um, something I'd imagine they bottle conditioned in the first place, and they're going to um, assume the carbonation is going to be where they want it the longer you hold the, the bottle, you know. Yeah. And I would think, too, that, like, uh, um, and this is just from what I have come to find out um, through my own beer making and research process is that the beers kind of go through uh, different stages. Like you'll get it, like talking about process fermentation, and everything else um, in the process, like the, 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 the solution that I'm pulling off the mash and running into the boil kettle is generally pretty clear has a bit of a haze to it because you are getting some some particulate flow mm-hmm. through from your mash tun and everything else. And then you throw all of your hops at it, and it dirties everything back up again. And then it'll settle out. You pitch your yeast, and then it dirties up again. And then it flocks and cleans out. Like, And then sitting in – like I've noticed that like even my home brews that have sat um, – so post-fermentation – they had a little bit of chill haze after, you know, cold, cold conditioning for, you know, four or five days and then carbonating for four or five more days. Um, there was still a bit of chill haze. But as the weeks went on, the even though that my beer was unfiltered by the time that I got down to the last bit of beer, it was, like, crystal fucking clear. So, and, and it's all just about, like, time and waiting, too, as far as filtration goes. Totally. Well, and if your beer is being held cold, yeah, I mean, that's kind of um, part of the importance of lagering. Over time, packaged beer that's held cold is always going to continue to get brighter because um, more and more solid particulate is just going to fall out of the beer. Uh, and, and just to clarify for people who don't know what the term bright beer means, that's just clarity in beer. Think about a Pilsner. Think about a Coors Light when you pour it into a glass. It is Corona. You can see through it. Mm, Corona. You can give yourself or somebody else the finger through it. Mm-hmm. And I'm done. Mostly the former, sometimes the latter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's again for for overall shelf stability. If you can get your beer that clear, it's awesome. You're, that's what your beer is always going to taste like is right there because everything that's in it's in it, and everything that's not's not. And it's not volatile because there's no solid particulate in it. But um, no one, my, my no brewery. one has that kind of patience, though. And, yeah. and, and from, from what I've noticed, <laughs> from what I've noticed, and in, in the trends of brewing over the last year is that even like, like, it's like at the homebrew scale, and you know, nothing against my own, you know, homebrewing brothers out there. You know, keep doing your thing, and the same thing with like even you know, nano brews or micro brews or whatever that are out there. There's just people are just like, yeah, it's a hazy IPA. Here you go. Just because they want to serve it and make money when they could actually let it sit for a while, clean up and serve potentially a, a better beer. But then you run into the issue of, uh, that hop creep, you know, that, oh. that weird oxidizing hop creep that happens with high hopped beers that just sit for too long of a time. Yeah. And storage space is always going to be an issue on that level. Because and... mm-hmm. everybody wants to make money. It's all about money. What's I money? Think... What's that shit? <laughs> <laughs> What's that like? <laughs> I wouldn't know. I'm um, I'm stoked um, to be a pub brewer, and I, and I want to say that I'm stoked to have pub breweries, breweries that feel very comfortable selling their own product under their own roof. Uh, it's better for the product, in my opinion, and it's better for the customer. We can kind of control those factors and make sure that, you know, we, you don't, as a craft brewer anymore, have to compete with the big guys in terms of packaging is where I was going after with that. I have worked in a packaging brewery before. It was my first brewing experience. It was Culmination Brewing in Portland, who does awesome work. Um, but I don't necessarily believe that packaging is for every brewery, nor is it necessarily for the best beers. No. Um, I think that... Mm-mm. Uh, a step not seen in that brewery flow chart because, you know, corporate America um, <laughs> is that um, yeah, breweries really, uh, when, when monasteries, so originally it was a, it was a home task and it was a task of women to brew beer. And then 
especially obviously in continental Europe, monasteries picked it up as a way of um, organizing people and, and, and daily tasks and nutritious and it's water and all these things. Brewing has always been craft up until it hasn't been. And craft breweries better serve themselves by keeping themselves craft. And I'm not knocking the big guys because we're, we're drinking Dogfish Head, who <coughs> they package beautifully. Uh, won't knock to shoot, so won't knock Firestone Walker. And it, packaging is fun. Everyone wants their record on a 45, and every brewer wants their um, – their beer in a 750 but uh i applaud those who just can serve right off the tap too because that's where we're at you know you yeah. know, like small communal breweries make great beer and they always have they have since the beginning of time and I, I love that so um even for me funny enough as we show people that flow chart if you're watching on youtube or or even talk about it like not all breweries package not all breweries want to my packaging is in a keg that I serve off of and I, I uh, talk to uh, my wonderful servers about how to present that beer, what that, yeah. why, why I did what I did. Well, I think um, my favorite example of that is uh, Boneyard Brewing here in Bend. Um, I don't know how much you guys do or don't know about Boneyard, but they have. They were all growler fills to go out of the like yeah. garage. They have like the number one most popular IPA in the entire town of Bend, Oregon, their RPM. They make some amazing beers. They're hot right running. They make great red ale, quite a few others. Um, they ran for, I want to say, seven or eight years without even a pub. Um, they had a tap room where they did growler fills to go, and then they sold kegs to local bars. And they are one of the most successful breweries in town. Uh, they're, they've got the most popular beers in town, and they just recently opened a pub. And the owner didn't really want to. It was like his managers and stuff that finally convinced him to open a pub. Um, but they just, I mean, they killed the game with literally nothing but to go beer off their own tap and off of other people's taps. They never package. They still don't package. They don't have bottles of cans fuck or I'm talking in supermarkets. They just fucking, you have to go somewhere to get a growler full of their beer if you want to take it home. It's rad. Yep. Well, that is the... That's the general overview I have of the, the process of beer making, unless there's a specialized question or not. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a fun process. It's a simple process, but it's also as complicated as you want to make it. And uh, some days making it more complicated makes it an insanely good beer, and sometimes it just kind of no, but makes I, you, I, I makes like you rip the, your head. Uh, uh, <laughs> Damn, I forgot my words. What happens when you smoke the drugs? <laughs> yeah, whatever, what man. What happens when you smoke the drugs? I told no, you but not I, but to I, do it. I like the mindset that you have as far as explaining to every home brewer out there and every pro brewer out there that everyone's process is going to be different because everyone's system is complete. You could still have – you could have identical systems – Right next to each other, and you could have two different brewers on them and make the same beer, and you guarantee that they're going to be slightly different. Well, I, in in in, in, a, in a sense, in a broad context. I mean, again, I, like we talk about packaging and Miller Coors, like their beers are the same every time. Sure, when you think about tasting, I try not to get too pretentious. I tasting is pretentious, but it's fun. Um, but. There are, there are things, everyone tastes things differently. Everyone can look at things. If you're looking for something, you will find it. There's that philosophy in tasting too. It's true. But, um, it's like, I love those people that but, go to like, but if wine you're looking tastings. at, if you're looking at the agricultural <laughs> sense of it and you're looking at, um, you know, if you're looking at breweries that are buying, um, locally sourced versus uh, big, big provider barley, both make good products. If you're looking at what hops you're getting, if you're looking at how you utilize things, then yes, you could feasibly write a recipe and give it to somebody else at a different brewery, and based upon their products and based upon their profit, or uh, I'm sorry, process, <laughs> profit. <laughs> Oops, Freudian slip. <laughs> um, based upon their process, you could predict that they, that those beers could be tastably different. Yeah, and for I think for a long time in brewing that was considered, or, or, or I think some people even consider a beer that to be a a bad thing. Whereas, like, other fermented beverages get this, oh, it's a random vintage. That's great. Um, you know, when we when – we, yeah. when I brew an IPA – Wine gets the random right. vintage. When I brew an IPA – You're just like, oh, you and, fucked that up. I try and make it 
the same to the recipe I made before that if it's supposed to be that way. But I, th- it's an organic product, and I allow for drift. I think, uh, and, and not packaging. That's a wonderful thing. We get to do that a little bit. Um, uh, I get excited by change, and I think that you know, as a beer lover, I get excited by change. How excited? Um, Pre- premature excited. Forty five percent of the way up. About forty five percent of the way up. To so like a full chub. to like full so mast. F- yeah, yeah. Just a, just a, shy. a full chub. <laughs> yeah. No, it still goes up a little bit. Only thirty. <laughs> only thirty three, man. Uh, so one other question I had while we're talking about the process and everything, um, thought be, might be fun to go around the room and, uh, as brewers yourselves, what's your favorite part of the process? The part where I get hard. I thought we just settled that. I thought we just settled that. Um, I love oak aging. I'm just going to say that my favorite part of that. No, 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 you stay, you stay You're You're in a good position. You're good. You're good. Um, I love oak aging, so secondary maturation is my favorite part of the process, and I'm glad to be alive to say something so pretentious as that. And for those that don't know, secondary maturation is things like barrels, fooders. Yeah. Um, um, I, I like wild aging, and I like um, – I'm, I'm very excited about barrels as a whole, whether it's a, a clean beer or a, or a wild beer, whether it's an imperial stout and a bourbon barrel or a sour beer and a, and a wine barrel. I'm – thrilled about that that part of the process that is the part i get my, if i could live in a room of barrels i, mean, I, I would i i said that a little <laughs> a, a little selfishly just making sure that i knew what i was i was talking about oh you were right okay were right. good yeah, yeah, totally. oh, good, check, good, right? good 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 <laughs> and, and that's not again you know there will be beer nerds out there uh, you can use barrels and fooders at all parts of the process but generally secondary maturation refers to after we fermented it this is that other way of packaging beer for a while and allowing it to continue to further develop its flavor become yeah. masterful become <laughs> elegant yep oh yes I speaking of bound books in that beer. <laughs> that's pretty much where that point is yes yep that is the leather bound book i smell here. notes of roasted oak that's like entirely and the beer i'm drinking peaches right <laughs> thomas what's your favorite part of the process man i think uh this level right now, it's just <clears throat> that idea of getting up in the morning and just having a day of creating uh, the beer. Nice. I don't know. Recipe I mean, development? Re- recipe, not, not even recipe development. It's just because I, I enjoy mm-hmm. like all the, the, the different processes or whatever, but it's it's the the day you like the morning you wake up like for for a home brewer that doesn't uh yeah, yeah. brew very often <laughs> that'll change <laughs> yeah. i love making beer but some days when i wake up i'm like fuck that's that's what i'm saying that's what that's why i'm i'm enjoying that part of the process right now because i know it's yeah, going to change it does change um, it's like cooking though. And you know, I mean, I, I, I love to cook and I, I professionally cook for a long time, but there were days where like going, but to the see, I didn't start, I didn't, I didn't start cooking at home and enjoy it. Like I kind of just got thrown into a kitchen was like, this is your career now. And yeah, like, yeah. I fucking hate cooking. And, and you know, uh, again, there's, there are days where I, I agree with you. I'm not trying to, I, I love waking yeah. up to brew, but that, that first initial snap that's lost it. You know, it's like, uh, <laughs> it's like Christmas anymore. Like I don't run down the stairs in my, uh, my boxer's like, what did I get? I'm oh, like, no, okay, dude. Okay, I need a cup of coffee. <laughs> I need a screwdriver. Down his and fucking thrown hops into yeah. a bucket. Who's, like, who's <laughs> making breakfast? <laughs> fucking boxers on, all the neighbors. Like, what the fuck? He's like, Clark Griswold out there. <laughs> Yeah, I got that. I got that look on my face where I plug everything in for the first I, time. Uh, when I when I homebrewed in Portland, um, shameless plug to my two friends uh, Steve Carr and, and David Turrison out there who I homebrewed with. Um, I, I loved every, like we, that, that, that was a Wednesday thing. It was always a Wednesday. It was always at a certain time. We, well, it was supposed to be a certain time. We would Kinda get like together and we would have a recipe planned out. Yep. Shameless plug. Shameless shot. Um, oh, wait, it, I'm not supposed to touch you. Six feet guys. Come on. <laughs> Man, he has I'm, a hard enough time figuring out what six inches is. I... Shameless plug, phrase. Okay. Totally. 
I do. Listen, I do. Some, someone was going to jump on that one. No, no one has in a very long time. Oh, no, no. Oh, oh. Love hey, same though, dude. Same. <laughs> sad, sad face. I feel you, bro. <laughs> um, I got, I got a feeling I was going to be mad at you for that one. Might be. <laughs> I guess, I guess we have to talk about that off camera. Moving on. <laughs> I can you remind me? I lost my train of thought. We smoked weed. We were talking about. You were talking about shamelessly um, plugging your friends over in Portland. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, no, I was just I was relating that you know there there was absolutely a time when like that was the best part of my week, and and there's still times where it's the best part of my week. I don't. Yeah, there's but, also but, times but where it's the worst. There's just it's yeah. professionally doing it. There's times where it, it's absolutely terrible. And there's times where don't, it's don't get me wrong. Triumphant. Don't get me wrong. I got up the other morning and was like, oh, I don't have to make beer today. So yeah, that's the, that is always the thing. I, it's like now I wake up and I'm like, oh, that's right. I do actually have to make beer today. I guess like love making a it, creative but. myself. I guess I think what you were getting at Thomas is like that concept of like the idea of going from a concept to a final product, like seeing like what you had in your mind in a bottle that you're drinking. Yeah. I guess that that's kind of how it is with a lot of the, the hobbies that I have, which I you think is why part of the process is like the process. the process work. Yeah. It's, it's the same thing with sound. <laughs> You know, I got sure. it, it's the it's the same thing with doing like a live show, you know, for twenty grand or Pedactor Project or Moonshine or Jameson or whatever other local band I want to fucking spit out right now. You know, yeah. nineteen eighty five. Yeah. You know, the Lucitones. This is the shameless plug episode. Oh yeah, we shameless just plug episode. It out to everybody, I, I love it. And I Should think I shamelessly plug my own shit real quick. We got uh, enjoy every day. You know, artists every day. Shit going on there. Buy Ten barrel things. brewing. There's another one. Wait a minute. Every, everyone had their turn to shamelessly plug. It's my turn. You can shamelessly plug in a minute. <laughs> there is too much plugging in general going on in this episode. Just but, plugging but, but, each other a lot. But to equate the, 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 the brewing process to another hobby that I have, yes, like doing sound and especially for several different genre styles of bands, especially just in Whitefish, you know, they're between – a, a a new wave cover band, uh, a, a, a rockabilly country, psychabilly type thing with uh, uh, Badger Hound. You got the funk band Twenty Grand. You got pseudo Paul Simon White Boy Reggae with Jameson and Assorted Seeds. I love you, Brent, but that's the best way that I can describe your shit. No, that's accurate. <laughs> like super accurate. Um. <laughs> You know, and, and things like, so I see mixing different bands as like making different types of beer. Totally. You That's know, and what I'm doing as far as like tweaking different instrumentation or uh, instrumentation levels in the mix or tweaking the EQ is just like how you build a malt profile or what yeast you use or how you build your, your, uh, your hot profile and all these other little fine tuning things so that when you turn the main volume up, everything's good. Yeah. I think it's a great way to see it. You it's know, a great way to so see it. <clears throat> I get ex like, yeah, as much as I bitch and moan about having to get up and have a hobby to make beer, you know, or, you know, go into a, uh, a, a live sound setting room, just like, ugh, I don't really feel like being here for the next six hours. But at the same time, I'm just like, I, I get past that within like the first 20 minutes. And then I'm just like, oh yeah, I get to create something like the beer's going to do whatever it's going to do. And the band's going to do whatever it's going to do. But I get to create something <clears throat> That creates an outcome of something else. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. For long winded, pot headed rants. Fuck okay. it. I did. it. <laughs> well, that's how I got on process. That's where, yeah. that's where we're at. Is that two Play Doh right there? Did we just nail it? Did we just nail it? Did we knock it out of the park? I think we did. Yeah. Josh, send us off on something good. Just tell us what the word is. The word is the bird, man. Because, you know, uh, if you haven't heard, 
Well, the the b- 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 bird 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 b- b- bird is the word. <laughs> well, I wasn't gonna stop him if he was gonna go through the whole thing. I was oh, like, I wasn't either. I thought I was like musical break. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I don't know. I, I don't honestly know what to send us off on. Uh, everyone, stay happy and healthy, because uh, and drink beer, because now you know the process of what it takes for a brewer who make this delicious elixir of life that we're all fucking sipping on right now. Cheers. Um, keep getting wasted. Keep ignoring um, every bullshit going on in the world right now and just appreciate life as it's supposed to be. Here, here. No, he's there. Oh, Roger. You're there. They're here. <laughs> They're here? Shit. They're here, man. They're fucking here. <laughs> Oh, man, I've been waiting for this moment my entire life. I'm so glad the aliens oh, finally decided to show up. No, they're here to take us away to a place of uh, endless fountains of beer where you battle your comrades every day until uh, you die and you wake up in the halls where you feast until you're, you go to sleep. Hey, and you wake up hey, the next day and battle hey, again. hey, you're just describing Valhalla. Oh, shit, am I? I don't know. <laughs> 